This video is part of yet another big history YouTube collaboration, this time talking about various events in French history, but more on that later. As always, before talking about the main point of the video, the Paris Commune, we have to understand the events that led up to its creation. So during the time leading up to 1871, France was an empire the second French Empire to be exact, led by Napoleon III, the same guy who installed Maximilian I on the Mexican throne, but I digress. So ever since Napoleon III's uncles defeated Waterloo, France was very politically unstable. Well, it was also politically unstable before then, but we don't have time to get into that. After Waterloo, the Bourbon dynasty was re-established in 1815, and outside of the Republican-leaning Parisians, this was initially accepted by the majority of French people who finally wanted some stability after all of the bloodshed that happened. Plus, the new Bourbon ruler, Louis XVIII, for obvious reasons, made sure to be more liberal monarch than his brother was. But when he died and his son, Charles X, came into power, a lot of the French people became again very disgruntled with the monarchy as Charles was a much more conservative monarch than his father was. This angered many people, especially in Paris whose inhabitants were far more republic-leaning than the rest of the country. Therefore, in 1830, the July Revolution started in Paris. The Parisians were initially supported in this by the rest of the country and within the three glorious days the Bourbon monarchy was overthrown. However, this is where the revolutionary movement divided. With most of the Parisians and some other big French cities wanting a republic and the rest of France just wanting a less conservative monarch. Therefore, once the dust had settled, the Bourbon monarchy was replaced by a more liberal monarchy under the new Orleanist dynasty. This establishment of a new, even though liberal monarchy, was seen as a betrayal by the Parisians as they wanted a republic, not a monarchy. Therefore, in 1832, they staged another Parisian rebellion, but this time it was unsuccessful and so the monarchy remained. But the status quo wouldn't hold long, as in February 1848, during the Year of Revolutions, Parisians rose up again and successfully overthrew the Orleanist monarchy. This republic yet again gained a more conservative character over time as most of the ruler France were still monarchist. Seeing the conservative shift of the republic, Parisians rebelled yet again that same year known as the June Days Uprising. This was unsuccessful and the conservative, at least to the Parisians, Napoleon III was elected as the president who then four years later proclaimed the establishment of the second French Empire. During this entire time Parisians became more and more disgruntled as they have rebelled and rebelled only for their dreams of a republic to be always crushed by the more conservative leaning ruler France that wanted a monarchy. Due to this feeling of suppression during the second French Empire Paris became a hotbed even more than it was before for leading leftist ideas. By 1870 Paris was full of Marxists, Jacobins, anarchists but also more milder socialists and all kinds of other leftists who had a hard time agreeing on stuff other than that the monarchy must go. This is not to say that there were no monarchy supporters in Paris or that every person who supported one of these movements believed in all of its ideas, but many of the working class people of Paris whose numbers have been growing steadily due to industrialization felt alienated by the monarchy and wanted a republic. But seeing the years of failure to establish a republic meant that many of these people ended up being drawn to more radical ideas as the only way to achieve this goal. This movement of Parisian working class people towards more radical ideas was further exacerbated by Napoleon's actions towards Paris. Not only due to fears of yet another Parisian revolution was Paris denied a city council, a benefit that many other cities in France had, but Napoleon also started extensive Parisian building projects, which created large beautiful boulevards for the rich while destroying a lot of working class housing in the process. This meant that Paris was well ready for another insurrection if given the chance, and such a chance came during the 1870-71 to Franco-Prussian War. The mood in Paris at the start of the war was surprisingly one of ultra patriotism, because the thing that the Parisians hated even more than the French monarch were the Prussians. However, France was completely stomped by the Prussians, with Napoleon and his 80,000 strong army being defeated and captured at Sedan. When the news of Napoleon's capture came to Paris, the city wasted no time and another Parisian revolution established the French Third Republic. Although at the moment, due to being in an active war, the new provisional government was just called the government of national defense. The Prussians were 
first not sure whether the new Parisian government of national defense was legitimate or whether it would continue with the war, but seeing that the government quickly started to mobilize new troops across France and made it clear to the Prussians that it was definitely not surrendering, the war resumed with Prussia quickly advancing and besieging Paris in September 1870. The French army stationed in Paris tried breaking the siege the first few months but was unsuccessful suffering high losses and therefore it didn't try such a move again. During this time, the new Minister of War, Leon Gambet, flew over the Prussian siege of Paris in a balloon so he could help mobilize a new French army outside of Paris with which he would later come and relieve the city. Meanwhile in Paris, the situation started to slowly deteriorate. Many high-class people of the city, most of whom owned much of the shops and industry within Paris, left before the Prussian siege started. This meant that the middle and lower class people, many of whom couldn't even afford to leave the city, were now stuck in a siege with no work as much of the industry outside of military manufacturing had been closed. Due to this, many of the working class people started to enlist en masse into the National Guard, since that remained the only reliable paying job within the city. The National Guard was an amateur military force organized by the government used to support the main military in times of need, like the current siege of Paris. Due to all these new enlistments, the National Guard in Paris swelled up to around 300 to 350,000 men. This was at least twice as much as the number of professional French soldiers in Paris at the time. The National Guard, along with many Parisians, was very fervent despite the army's inability to break the siege. They thought that with their numbers and zeal, they could easily break the siege and push the Prussians out of France. Their army, however, knowing better, wouldn't let them attack, and so the siege continued while the food shortage in the city became more and more problematic. The food situation in Paris was so dire in fact that there are reports of Parisians eating horses or even rats to stay alive. And one Parisian even wrote that a desperate woman came up to him offering sexual favors for nothing more than a piece of bread. All this, combined with Parisian and National Guard vehement belief that they could defeat the Prussians if only the army and the government would let them, resulted in growing resentment in Paris against the government. Not only are they not allowing the National Guard to attack the Prussians, they're not attacking themselves. Not to mention that the new mobilized French army that Leo Gambet so famously flew on a balloon to organize didn't come to relieve the city as promised. This was because the Prussians defeated all the new mobilized armies of the Third Republic, but due to blocked communication lines, Parisians didn't know this at first and once they did find out, they blamed the new government for the losses anyways. Some Parisians going as far as to say that the new government wanted to lose to the Prussians. After many Parisian demonstrations and even an unsuccessful attempt at coup, the army along with the government finally allowed the National Guard to salve out in January to try to take some key points outside of the city. The National Guard, in a fervent zeal with no real plan, attacked the Prussian lines head on only to be utterly defeated. One of these fervent revolutionaries wrote, At first the National Guard swept the Prussians before them, but the mud defeated the brave son of the people. They sank into the wet earth up to their ankles and unable to get their artillery up on the hills, they had to retreat. Hundreds stayed behind, lying quietly in death. These men of the National Guard, men of the people, artists, young persons, died with no regrets for their lost lives. The earth drank the blood of the first Parisian carnage, soon it will drink more. Despite this unsuccessful breakthrough, the fact that all the French armies were defeated and that most of Eastern France was under Prussian occupation, the Parisians remained adamant that they could still win the war, somehow. Therefore, when the government signed an armistice with the Prussians 28th of January, Parisians felt backstabbed by the new republic. How could they surrender? How could they negotiate peace when the jewel of France, the capital city, still has not fallen to the enemy? Despite these Parisian feelings, the war was over and the government of national defense held an election across France in February 1871 to replace it. This newly elected council was meant to negotiate the peace terms with Prussia and later determine how France would continue after the war. The council had 650 seats, with Paris having 42 of those. All 42 elected members from Paris were leftists that supported the continuation of the war. However, another 400 seats, mostly coming from rural France, 
France were former monarchists wanting peace. The council selected a guy named Thiers as the new head. Parisians viewed the election results in horror. Too many times have they created a republic only for the rest of rural France to form yet another monarchy. And it was happening again. And just as you thought that the Parisians couldn't hate the new government more than they already did, a series of events made it possible. Not only did the new government settle on a peace deal with Prussia, which acknowledged the French defeat, an outcome which as stated was hated by the Parisians, but they also allowed the Prussian army to hold a parade in Paris. A city that as far as the Parisians were concerned wasn't conquered by the Prussians and therefore they had no right to hold a parade in it. However, the parade happened anyways, and the Parisians were so horrified by this that there are accounts that after the parade ended, some Parisians went outside to wash the very street the Prussians walked on as to cleanse it from the German stench. With that said, the Prussians didn't leave. They just camped outside of Paris and waited until the war reparations defined in the peace deal were paid by the French. So as I talk about the following events, keep in mind the Prussians were just there watching it all happen. Anyways, since the war was over now, Thiers started to implement some new laws to try to start up the economy of the capital city. However, these laws seemed more targeted at trying to agitate the Parisians than anything else. For example, Thiers lifted the pause on rent, significantly lowered the pay of the National Guard and lifted the moratorium on debts and pawn shops. This was significant because Parisians went in to debt or pawned a lot of their possessions during the siege to try to get money to buy food, thinking that since the moratorium was in place on debts and pawn shops, they could just pay the debts and buy their stuff back once work resumed in the city. But work didn't resume in the city. In fact, even more shop owners and businessmen who weren't able to leave the city before the siege left now since Paris during this entire time was very unstable, with protests against the new government happening on a daily basis and unpredictable armed national guards were roaming the streets. Even military manufacturing, the last working industry in the city, stopped since the war was over. All this meant that Thiers' actions that were meant to get the money flowing again through the economy just angered the Parisians even more since they had no money and there was no work to get more money. Therefore by March, 150,000 bankruptcies were declared in the city. With all this happening, the last straw was when Thiers ordered the army to disarm the National Guard, starting with capturing the cannons. And oh boy, they couldn't have chosen a worse target. You see, these cannons were very symbolic to the Parisians. Not only were they built in Paris for the war, but they were paid off by donations from Parisians so they could defeat the Prussian siege. Those cannons symbolized everything the Parisians had fought for in the past few months and the government which they hated was now trying to take the cannons away from them. Naturally, a fight broke out between the two sides and due to the incompetence of the military officers in charge, the Parisians managed to win, capturing two military officers and executing them. Hearing this news and seeing the insurrection now happening all across Paris, Thiers with the government decided to relocate to Versailles on the 18th of March. Paris, now being abandoned by its only governing body, since remember Paris had no city council, it was directly controlled by the main French government, decided to create and appoint their own city council since they needed someone to govern them. They named this new city council the Paris Commune. This name, contrary to popular belief, has nothing to do with communism. Commune just means city or county council in French. In fact, there are currently over 36,000 communes in France. The makeup of the city council, which met for the first time on the 20th of March, was interesting to say the least. It was a hodgepodge of all kinds of leftist groups, from simple republicans to Marxists, Jacobins, anarchists, Blanquists, etc. Plus, even though the council had 92 members, only 60 of them ever bothered to show up to the meetings with the rest either recognizing the Versailles government or not wanting to be elected in the first place. One Parisian summarized the members of the council by saying, the names of the men in the new government posted are names so unknown that it seems like a joke. This statement was quite apt, since many of the council members were simple workers and artisans who before this never held any administrative position in their life. But despite this, many Parisians still felt quite emboldened by one saying, Paris and the whole country must know the nature, the reason, the aim of the revolution which is being carried out. 
and the responsibility for the mourning, the suffering and the tragedies of which we are victims must fall on those who, after having betrayed France and sold Paris to the foreigner, are pursuing with blind and cruel obstinacy the ruin of the capital in order to bury in the disaster of the Republic and liberty to do witness of their treason and their crime. However, as Parisians established their own city council, they never actually declared independence from France, or some kind of a war on France, or even their own independent governance. In reality, they just established their city council, which they still saw as part of the same greater administration, and were trying to decide what to do next, with, yes, some people, like the person I just quoted, proposing a communist revolution or attack on the government in Versailles, but others, which were the majority, were hoping to negotiate with the Versailles government on terms such as Paris getting its own city council, more rights to the workers, the abolishment of Thiers' economic laws, etc. But Thiers was having none of it. He declined to negotiate with the commune and quickly labeled the insurgency in Paris as a revolution that needs to be put down. Then he started massing troops for an attack on the city. This meant that the Paris commune, without actually declaring independence, became independent for a period of less than three months. This is when most of the laws cited by people talking about the commune were passed by the council. A vast majority of these never got implemented due to a lack of time, funds and sometimes just apathetic nature of the populace towered some of these laws. However, some notable laws passed outside of abolishing Othier's economic laws were the separation of church and state, abolishment of the death penalty, the continuation of production in military factories, the restarting of production in closed and abandoned factories slash workshops, abolishment of conscription, etc. All of these points, however, had their caveats. Yes, conscription was abolished, but now every healthy working adult was considered as being automatically part of the National Guard, which was the main military body of the commune. Yes, the commune abolished the death penalty, but some radical members of the National Guard did execute several priests and or people deemed to be spies of the Versailles government. Yes, the workers were given the right to resume production in abandoned factories and workshops, basically managing it all themselves, but the commune never nationalized anything, they still recognized all the original owners' rights to the factories and businesses. The commune even negotiated with the Bank of France to give them a loan to fund all of this. By the way, the Bank of France was located in Paris, pretty defenseless and still full of gold since the Versailles government didn't have time to move it. But despite this, the communards decided it would be better working with the bank rather than nationalizing it. The reason why all these actions of the commune weren't actually so communist was because the city council as mentioned before was very divided, with many people following more milder leftist ideas than others. Therefore, oftentimes compromises had to be made, hence the laws passed by the commune were leftist but not very Marxist or anarchist. The commune existed in this weird limbo state until Sunday 21st of May 1871 when Thiers, finally having a big enough army, attacked Paris. What followed next was brutal street to street fighting between the French forces and the National Guard. Buildings were lit on fire, barricades erected and hundreds of communards killed slash executed when captured. There was no winning for the commune and many of the men knew this surrendering the first chance they got, but many were also very radicalized at this point, refusing to surrender and fighting to the last breath. It took the French forces an entire week to finally take control of the entire city, a week which is remembered today as the bloody week. And so, 28th of May, the Paris Commune ended, existing for only 71 days. There were around 1,000 French army deaths, and depending on who you ask, around 5 to 25,000 communard deaths. Thiers had no mercy for the captured communards, with some of them being executed and others exiled or deported to the furthest French colonies. Thiers very provocative action towards Paris after the Franco-Prussian War has led some historians to believe he agitated the population on purpose trying to instigate a revolution that he could then put down and that way solidify control. Others say he was just very incompetent, and most likely it was a mixture of both. But one thing Thiers made sure of by the way he ended the commune was that he created a giant symbol for the radical leftists in Europe. The way Thiers branded the commune an enemy from the get-go, the fact that he completely refused negotiating with them, and the way he ended its existence in a bloody week meant that he created thousands of martyrs for the European radical leftists. Many leftist thinkers like Marx quickly jumped 
jumped on this opportunity and wrote about the commune as an idealized communist state that was brutally destroyed by the upper classes. And if only it would have done certain things differently, like nationalizing the bank, it would have succeeded in taking down the Versailles government. But none of this was really true. The Paris Commune was leftist, yes, but it definitely was not some glorious communist state or an active revolution of the whole proletariat. Nor outside of a few radicals did it want to take down the Versailles government. It was far from any idealized communist revolution as portrayed by Marx. But this did not matter. Many of the leftist movements of the following decades needed a symbol and the Paris Commune became that symbol. When the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, they saw the commune as their predecessor and started buying up every possible commune memorabilia they could get their hands on. An original communard red flag is buried with Lenin to this day and another communard red banner was sent to space by the USSR in 1964. Due to all this communist idealization of the Paris Commune, the Commune is today remembered as one of the first communist states in history, which isn't really true. It was a new thing and was on the left side of the political spectrum, but it definitely was not communist. This video is part of Project France, where 9 other history YouTubers talk about various other parts of French history with many of them also doing some small collabs within each other's videos. If you want to watch all these videos, you can find the link to the playlist in the top right corner, or at the top of the description, or the pinned comment. Honestly, the links to the playlists are everywhere, so there shouldn't be any excuse to not go watch the playlist. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know I didn't have time to talk about women's role in the commune or Jaroslav Dobrovsky involvement in it or the whole division of the city council into different administrative entities in the later half of the commune's existence or the ridiculous way the national guard was actually structured, etc. But as always, there's only so many things I can talk about in one video. This video was made possible thanks to my amazing patrons. Thank you very much. My name is Emlazer and as always, stick around for history.